This lecture is part two of the amyloid lecture on the role of amyloid in Alzheimer's and related dementias. I'm Hank Paulson. I'm the director of the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center and the Lucille Groff Professor of Neurology. I should mention that I'm the recipient of grants from the NIH, including the P30 Alzheimer's Disease Core Center grant that makes this talk possible. I also recently completed a research contract with Ionis Pharmaceuticals on an unrelated disease, spinocerebellar ataxia type 3. In this part two of this two-part series, I will review some of the possible toxic actions of A-beta. I'll also uh, hope you understand the concept of prodromal disease and the slow regional spread in major dementias. And I hope that you will be able to identify routes to possible disease-modifying therapy that are centered on beta amyloid. Some of the key terms uh, include those from part one, proteinopathy, amyloid and amyloid hypothesis. But in addition, two new terms in this part two include synaptopathy or disease of the synapse and the prion-like behavior of proteins. In part one of this series, I covered the first three points in the lesson outline, that is neurodegenerative proteinopathies, and amyloid is a recurrent theme in Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, frontotemporal dementia. I also reviewed the amyloid cascade in Alzheimer's disease as a key element of disease pathogenesis, that is amyloid as an initiator of the process of disease. We also focused on the genetic factors that drive the accumulation of amyloid in disease. In part two of this series, we will explore some of the toxicities that exist with A-beta, including monomers, oligomers, and plaques. I'll review again the prodromal phase of disease we now recognize that Alzheimer's, and in fact, all the primary dementias, are slowly progressive disorders. And we'll discuss the idea of regional spread, spread through circuitry. We'll very briefly review the relationship of A-beta to tau, which is very much a work in progress, and you'll hear about that in other lectures by other investigators. And finally, to round up our discussion of the amyloid theme, we'll discuss potential routes to disease-modifying therapy based on A-beta and amyloid. I showed this in part one of the series, but I think it's important to review this right now. The idea that uh, there can be many different causes of disease, including genetic risk factors, disease-causing genes, age itself, that lead to an increase in A-beta peptide accumulation. A-beta peptide accumulates to form fibrils that ultimately lead to the plaques that we know as a key pathological hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. This, in ways that are still not fully understood, injures neurons. The injured neuron has altered metabolism. This, in ways that are still being discovered, alters tau behavior, including the hyperphosphorylation that leads tau to form ordered fibrils within neurons, that is, the neurofibrillary tangles, which we know are highly injurious to neurons. Neurons, when they're injured, particularly when they fail to connect properly, have broad neuronal and circuitry dysfunction that ultimately leads to dementia, the clinical features of functional impairment that, are, that underlie dementia, as well as the atrophy globally that occurs in Alzheimer's. I also mentioned that this is not a strictly neuronal disease. Non-neuronal cells, including astrocytes and microglia, play a key role in regulating what happens in disease. Again, the important point here is that this is an amyloid cascade with amyloid initiating the process. I'm showing you now what would, I would consider a higher resolution view of the amyloid cascade. This is from a very nice review recently from Dennis Selko and, and John Hardy. And here they talk both about dominantly inherited forms of disease, which are relatively rare in Alzheimer's, tend to occur early uh, in the 40s, and the non-dominant forms of Alzheimer's, which are the overwhelmingly majority of Alzheimer's disease, uh, by definition typically occurring after age 65. In both cases, there are various reasons for this, but ultimately there is accumulation and oligomerization of A-beta. And they mentioned A-beta 42 here, which is the most amyloidogenic of the A-beta peptides that, that are formed. And this occurs particularly in the association cortices and the cortices and the limbic cortices. There can be subtle effects of A-beta oligomers on the synapse, and we'll talk about that in more detail. This, in turn, actually may lead to changes in kinase and phosphatase signaling pathways, 
which affect tau and cause the nerve fibrillar tangles. But as shown here, these effects on synaptic efficacy uh, can have problems, can lead to diffuse plaques. You can then, then have the microglia and astrocytes that become activated, and the inflammatory response itself can be both good and bad in disease. This can alter uh, neuronal homeostasis in many ways, including ionic homeostasis, and lead to oxidative injury, which itself is bad to the neurons. And eventually, this again leads to widespread neuronal and synaptic dysfunction, ultimately causing dementia. We'll spend time today talking about some of these steps. So let's begin with discussion of toxic A-beta species. I showed this cartoon from David Eisenberg's paper in part one of this lecture, again mentioning that the beta amyloid protein begins as a monomer, it's intrinsically unfolded, forms a nucleus that eventually becomes highly ordered and makes a beta sheet rich detergent resistant fibril. Now are monomers toxic, are oligomers toxic, are fibrils toxic? This is one of the big questions that has haunted the field of Alzheimer's and all the dementias for many years. And while there are s some bits of evidence that suggest monomers can be toxic, and there's clearly some evidence that fibrils are not all good, most of the recent data suggests that oligomers may be the most toxic, toxic species of the beta amyloid protein. Here is uh, one nice piece of data from a paper about 10 years ago, uh, also from uh, Dr. Selko's group, where they actually isolated dimers, let's call these the smallest oligomer that can occur, from Alzheimer's disease brain lysates. These were soluble oligomers, these were not part of plaques, so they took Alzheimer's disease brain lysates, or they took controlled lysates, they isolated these soluble oligomers, and they sprinkled them onto brain slices in culture. And what happened when you did this and you measured long-term potentiation, which we think of as, a, if you will, an electrophysiological proxy of memory, the normal long-term potentiation that is seen under control conditions, and is seen even when you incubate these slices with lysate from control brains, is markedly reduced when you incubate it with Alzheimer's disease brain. This is simply a histogram showing the level of this reduction in LTP. And again, for the Alzheimer's disease brains, there was a reduction in synaptic plasticity caused by these oligomers of A-beta. This is only one bit of data. There are many lines of evidence to suggest that dimers or other oligomers of A-beta can affect synaptic properties, can affect neuronal integrity. Here is another piece of data. This is actually uh, from a review from Eric Roberson's group, and the image itself is directly reprinted with permission from Larson et al. in the journal Neuroscience in 2012. And what's shown here are hippocampal neurons in culture that have been sprinkled with A-beta oligomers. And I think you can appreciate in this particular picture here that the dendrites of the neurons are sprinkled heavily with the beta amyloid oligomer, shown here as these yellow dots. Here you can see co-localization of the A-beta with the postsynaptic marker PSD95. Here in panel C, there's no yellow, that is the green and the red are separate, and the green representing the beta A-beta oligomers is separate from the presynaptic marker here for synaptophysin. So again, these are postsynaptic uh, uh, dendritic uh, binding of the A-beta to neurons. Now, this doesn't prove that A-beta is bad for neurons, but when you have such a selective binding to the post-synaptic dendritic complex, this cannot be good for the cells. Now, I've mentioned uh, just a few bits of data that oligomers are likely toxic in ways and injurious to neurons and affect neuronal function, but that doesn't mean the amyloid plaques themselves are inert. Apologize for this misspelling of amyloid. Here is shown uh, 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 some plaques stained for the beta secretase enzyme base. Here, these are plaques, and they're stained with for the uh, proteins bassoon, synaptophysin, MAP2, and cathepsin D. And what this is simply showing you here is that the dystrophic neurites that are found in and around the plaques. Are staying uh, with antibodies to base, that is the beta secretase enzyme itself is increased there, uh, as well as cathepsin D, as well as synaptophysin, 
but not with this particular uh, uh, active zone protein bassoon. Uh, what this indicates really is that even though the plaques themselves may be largely aggregated fibrils that largely are an inert, there's probably reactive surfaces here and the dystrophic neurites here which show microtubule disruption, elevation of the beta secretase enzyme, probably worsening the production of beta amyloid, uh, are actually contributing to the disease. So my point here is simply to, to remember, to remind you that amyloid plaques themselves probably do have some continuing damage that occurs over time in the brain of those with Alzheimer's. Collectively, data over the last 10 years have led to the view of Alzheimer's disease as in part a synaptopathy, that is the disease of circuits, disease of synapses. This is a schematic cartoon from a paper from Li Wei Tsai's group uh, showing different types of cells in the brain, a cytatory neuron, inhibitory neuron, microglia, and astrocytes. You can notice the connections that exist here with these robust dendritic and axonal arborizations. Here in prodromal AD, you begin to see amyloid fibrils around. Uh, these cells are losing some of their synaptic connections, but they're very mild and not leading to significant signs of disease. Later in disease, with larger plaques and intracellular damage from tangles, one begins to see a complete failure of these connections between neurons that may still be alive and changes in the behavior of microglia and astrocytes. Uh, and so again, a lot of things going on in circuitry as well as the non-neuronal cells of disease in later stages of disease. But the important point here is that the cells may still be there but losing their connections. This could underlie many of the manifestations of disease clinically and yet these neurons might be retrievable if therapies were found. This reminds us to speak about the long extended prodrome of disease and the idea of regional spread across circuitries. An important point is that the primary degenerative dementias are slowly progressive diseases in which abnormal protein accumulation begins years before clinical manifestations. This is true for Alzheimer's, it's true for Lewy body dementia, it's true for FTD. Not as true for the prion diseases which can be fairly rapid disorders. We know this now because, in part because, we can non-invasively image amyloid accumulation in the brain of individuals using PET ligand imaging. Here we are seeing a single image of a control individual and an Alzheimer's disease individual that have been uh, injected with Pittsburgh compound B that can be imaged in the brain. Pittsburgh compound B actually binds to amyloid plaques. In the control brain, of course, there is very little amyloid accumulation, whereas in the Alzheimer's brain, in the association of limbus, limbic cortices, here shown in the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes and the temporal lobes, there's substantial accumulation of beta amyloid. This is used frequently in research now. It is FDA approved, but it is typically not used in clinical practice because it is not reimbursed by insurance companies. There is an idea study going on currently at our place and elsewhere to really determine whether identifying amyloid in the brain does change the behavior of doctors with respect to patients in terms of diagnosis and treatment. So perhaps at some point in the near future, there may be reimbursement for this kind of imaging of amyloid in the brain. So here we're now looking again at PET imaging uh, of a control subject here on the left, another control subject here, and an Alzheimer's disease subject, stained for amyloid accumulation in the brain. I think it's obvious that this control individual does not have amyloid. It's obvious this individual with Alzheimer's disease has abundant amyloid plaque in the brain. What's interesting here is a subset of individuals who are cognitively normal clearly have amyloid accumulation in the brain. Shown over here are plots of cognitively normal individuals, individuals with mild cognitive impairment, often viewed as a precursor to the clinical dementia of Alzheimer's disease, and individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And they are the mean levels of, of, of basically amyloid binding, PIB-PET binding, are shown here for individuals with cognitively normal MCI or Alzheimer's dementia. You can see clearly in Alzheimer's disease, most people have elevated beta amyloid in the brain. And in MCI, many of these individuals, of course, also have elevated beta amyloid. In cognitively normals, it's not at all surprising that so many of them 
have no amyloid or very low levels of amyloid. But interestingly, just as shown here, many individuals who are cognitively normal have elevated amyloid in their brain. And I'm showing you here now, separating out those individuals who have MCI, who have amyloid accumulation, these individuals are very likely to go on to develop clinically manifest Alzheimer's dementia over time. These individuals with MCI, it's highly unlikely that they have Alzheimer's as the basis of their MCI, whether they go on to dementia or whether they stay static in their MCI or even improve is an important point. And these individuals here who are cognitively normal may go on to develop MCI and eventually Alzheimer's disease. The point here is it indicates that for many, many years before Alzheimer's is clinically manifest, there are pre-symptomatic individuals. This is the prodrome of disease. Many individuals who go on to develop Alzheimer's disease have amnestic MCI or memory predominant MCI for several years before they develop signs of mild and then eventually moderate or severe dementia. And we, we now know that, uh, that we could image amyloid across the pre-symptomatic period and the MCI period and use this to partition those individuals who are likely to go on to develop true Alzheimer's disease from those that will not. The spread of amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease and the spread of tangles do not exactly map up, but they do show something interesting. For example, the plaque elevation over time in Alzheimer's disease seems to spread in a way that exactly maps to the default mode network. The default mode network is a, a network of neurons that are connected and can be visualized as being basally active even when the brain is relatively quiet, quiescent. That is, these are sections of the parietal and temporal and frontal lobes that are synaptically active even when we are trying to rest. And it's these parts of the brains that first develop the amyloid and accumulate over time. In contrast, the tau accumulates more in the uh, mesial temporal lobe and in parts of the brainstem and then spreads further out from there. There's evidence to suggest that this spread is occurring across synapses. That is, there is cell-to-cell -cell spread. Why do we think this might be occurring? Well, there's reasons to think so. For example, we already know that there are communicable prion diseases. For example, a mad cow disease or Kuru disease or a, a prion disease that had, had in the past been uh, received through blood products or through cadaveric uh, transplants. In these individuals, clearly a few prions in the transmitted material then somehow communicates across cells to cause one's internal prion to change shape and lead to the prion disease. The progressively affected regions in Alzheimer's, for example, as well as in FTD, comprise circuits. Some of the proteins that accumulate in the various dementing proteinopathies, including Alzheimer's, FTD, and Lewy body disease, are ones we can absolutely visualize in the CSF. They include beta amyloid, tau, synuclein, and prion. We've recognized, particularly in animal models, that immunization against beta amyloid or other proteins can mitigate disease features. And clinical trials are in place right now to see if this could actually be used as a therapy for humans. Data over the last five years has shown quite abundantly for beta amyloid and for synuclein and perhaps even for tau, that injecting an exogenous disease protein can induce neuropathological changes, not only in the region of the brain where the injection occurred, but would spread over time to other regions in the brain, provided that the mouse or the rat model system has the appropriate substrate. And finally, some individuals who received fetal brain transplants for their Parkinson's disease to replenish dopamine-producing neurons later went on to die, and their brains were viewed at autopsy. And those individuals who'd had their transplants just a few years before were noted to have Lewy bodies, even in those fetal neurons that had been transplanted just a few years ago. So instead of having aged for 70 years, those neurons were a few years old, and somehow they'd already acquired Lewy bodies. Is this also an indication of some kind of a communication across cells? This regional spread that occurs, whether it's due to some cell-to-cell prion-like property or whether it's uh, due to something else, I think in some way underlies the different faces of Alzheimer's disease. The most common form of Alzheimer's is the amnestic form, 
This is the typical late onset, say after age 65, individual who has slowly progressive memory problems, later develops word finding problems, executive dysfunction, and becomes profoundly demented. But really, forgetfulness becomes one of the first features and profound memory loss becomes one of the hallmarks clinically of disease. But there are other forms other variants of Alzheimer's disease that typically occur at slightly younger ages and are much less common. For example, posterior cortical atrophy, logopenic variant of Alzheimer's disease, and frontal variant of Alzheimer's disease. And these three different variants, uh, respectively, involve more of the visual processing areas, the language areas, and the behavioral control areas of our brain. Recently, Beyond the amyloid imaging I already showed you, tau PET ligand imaging has become available and has begun to shed light on this regional pathology in the various forms of Alzheimer's disease. Let me just give you one example, and that is with posterior cortical atrophy. Posterior cortical atrophy is a devastating condition. People will be in their 50s or 60s, and they lose the ability to process visual information. They may be unable to read or synthesize a picture. They may fail to be able to write something. They may fail to understand how to use a spoon because they can't identify what the spoon is. This is quite different from typical Alzheimer's disease, and it suggests more of a posterior involvement, in particular the parietal lobes and the occipital lobes. Looking at posterior cortical atrophy, or PCA, versus Alzheimer's disease, early features of disease, early stage of disease, John Day of the uh, Washington University St. Louis group, working with uh, Dr. John Morris, actually performed beta amyloid PET imaging and tau imaging in individuals with early stage PCA or early stage Alzheimer's disease. And this is a sing single figure from their paper. In the top, what you can see here on the left is amyloid imaging in the brain for amnestic Alzheimer's disease for PCA and cognitively normal individuals. And over here, is tau imaging of the brain, again, for amnestic Alzheimer's, PCA, and cognitively normal individuals. What's shown in the bottom part are the difference maps. So this is the actual full degree of staining for A-beta, or amyloid plaques, and for uh, tau. And this is the difference map. So let's just focus on the difference maps here. Obviously, in amnestic Alzheimer's disease individuals versus controls, there's lots of amyloid in the brain in the parietal and temporal lobes and the frontal lobes. You can see that quite nicely here. You can see that in PCA versus controls, there's relatively little amyloid that's accumulated versus controls. Again, it's in the same area, but less so than the scene with the amnestic AD, okay? Uh, and of course, in PCA versus amnestic AD, there's no more amyloid in PCA than there is in amnestic AD. I think the really interesting results come forward with the tau imaging. You can see tau imaging in amnestic individuals versus Alzheimer's, and there's robust tau presence in the parietal lobes and in the uh, temporal lobes, as well as in the frontal lobes here, not in the occipital lobes. Now, here are the individuals with PCA. Remember, PCA affects the visual processing information, and you can see massive amounts of tau everywhere uh, in the brain, particularly in the parietal, temporal, and frontal lobes, as well as in the occipital lobe. So the tau signal here and here's the difference map between PCA and Alzheimer's. The tau signal map is saying this damage in the occipital and parietal lobes, this tau accumulation is consistent or associated with the particular clinical symptoms that we're seeing in PCA. This is just one example of how tau imaging is beginning to change the game. And we're going to begin to understand the relationship between A beta and tau much better as more information is learned from tau imaging. Let me briefly touch on the relationship of a beta amyloid to tau. And let me say that the reality is, although many people have looked at this for years, we still do not fully understand the links between beta amyloid and abnormal tau behavior. The slide I showed you earlier of an amyloid cascade with arrows, you noticed there were question marks. And there are still question marks about how beta amyloid in cells or outside of cells can alter the metabolism of neurons that leads to hyperphosphorylation of tau and accumulation of tau. A related point is, I think, is that most people in the field would view A-beta as an initiator of disease and tau as an executioner. That is, you can't have disease unless A-beta is there, 
But tau is the critically important intracellular protein that can kill neurons. This is a single uh, schematic diagram linking A beta to dysfunction of the dendrite uh, in neurons. And in this particular schematic, there's also tau and how tau may be affected. This is from a review by Eric Roberson's group uh, that I, I recommend. And what it's showing you here is that beta amyloid can do a number of things at the dendrite, including increasing calcium levels, which in turn can affect calcineurin and calpain. Uh, uh, this can influence uh, uh, neurofibrillary tangles uh, and tau formation. There are lots of changes to proteins at the synapse in the presence of A-beta. There's a reduction in many of these proteins. This in turn can affect various things, including the behavior of tau in relationship to the postsynaptic density, and that may have influenced tau behavior. The point I'm making here is that we don't really know how A-beta itself affects tau, and it's probably not a direct effect, but rather multiple indirect effects over time that lead to changes in the behavior of tau that ultimately cause it to be hyperphosphorylated and aggregate in the brain. So that is a topic that's uh, only briefly touched on here because I think that uh, uh, our colleagues uh, who give you a lecture on tau will discuss that in much greater detail. Let me finish talking about potential routes to disease-modifying therapy based on the A-beta amyloid hypothesis. I already showed you this particular slide of the biomarkers accumulated as a function of time. Right now, the emphasis on anti-amyloid therapies is focusing at relatively early stages of disease in individuals who do not yet have cognitive symptoms or have only mild cognitive symptoms, and including assessment of individuals who are at high risk for Alzheimer's disease because they have familial AD mutations. These are individuals who would have beta amyloid accumulation in their brain, as shown here by this line here, this purple line, uh, but yet do not have dementia. And if an anti-amyloid therapy is going to work, it better work here. So it was almost two decades ago that uh, Del Shank and colleagues showed that if you immunized mice, Alzheimer's mice, with beta amyloid, it essentially cleared the plaques from the brain of the mice, and the mice no longer showed the cognitive deficits that were seen in the AD mouse models. I thought then, and I think many scientists felt, that we'd have a cure for Alzheimer's within a few years. Well, two decades later, we still don't have a disease-modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that we may be treating a bit too late. The horse is, if you will, already out of the barn. If you already have massive beta amyloid accumulation in the brain, you've already had the synaptopathy going on for a decade, so that you've lost many of the connections, and indeed some of the neurons, it may be asking too much to eliminate beta amyloid and improve brain function, recover, recover the brain function that was lost. So it's led to the view that really it's in these early phases of disease, in the pre-symptomatic period, or maybe in MCI, that is the ideal early prevention zone. And it's in this area right now that anti-amyloid therapies are being tried. If it's going to work, it's going to work here. It's been tried here, and it hasn't really shown efficacy out here. Now, many studies have been negative thus far, and that's been discouraging, but I think it's important to recognize that the idea of a monoclonal antibody that can be anti-amyloid and can reduce beta amyloid accumulation in the brain is not simply an idea. There's evidence to support it deeply. Here, for example, is a paper from last year in Nature by Savigny et al., in which they injected, in a phase 1b study, 165 individuals with the anti-A-beta antibody aducanumab. These individuals uh, received um, different doses of the medication versus placebo and were evaluated at baseline in one year later. These are individuals who had amyloid in their brain at baseline. So you can see here the baseline images for these individuals all had beta amyloid, shown here as this red accumulation in the brain. And then they're evaluated one year later. These, this individual had placebo. This individual had three milligrams per kilogram of the aducanumab six milligrams per kilogram, and 10 milligrams per kilogram. I think you can appreciate that all three doses, there's a marked reduction in the beta amyloid accumulation that's present in these individuals. That's pretty striking. Uh, so this was a profound effect on beta amyloid. But there was only the suggestion of better scores clinically 
cognitively in the treatment group over the placebo group. And importantly, and this was one of the problems that occurred at greater levels in earlier anti-amyloid therapy trials, was that the higher doses were associated with increased amyloid-related imaging abnormality, or ARIA. That is, there's sort of a almost inflammatory-like signal that can occur here, so we have to be very careful about doses and that potential, potential side effect of the medication. So with that kind of encouraging result, are, are we giving up? No, I would say the anti-amyloid therapies are still very much a work in progress. There are several monoclonal beta amyloid antibody trials that are enrolling healthier subjects with uh, uh, AD syndrome, including cronezumab, aducanumab, and gantanerumab. Several of these antibody trials have modified their protocol so that the dose is increased based on therapeutic failures of related trials. So we'll see if those anti-amyloid therapies work. There are also base inhibitor studies. These are inhibitors of the beta secretase enzyme that cleaves beta amyloid from the protein that are still enrolling subjects. Uh, one study by Merck failed in AD, but they're still doing the trial in MCI, so we'll keep our fingers crossed there. And finally, and I think this is quite exciting, anti-tau antibodies are now enrolling for uh, 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 phase one and phase two studies now. So we'll see where that goes. So in summary, in this second part of the amyloid talk, I hope I've conveyed to you that A-beta oligomers are likely the primary toxic species in Alzheimer's disease, although importantly, plaques are probably not innocuous structures. I think it's increasingly viewed that Alzheimer's disease is in part a synaptopathy, that is a disease of connections between neurons, and that impaired circuitry contributes to disease. Let me add as well that the circuitry that underlies disease also may be the pathways through which the disease proteins spread over time and describe some of the slowly progressive regional spread that we've seen. The fact that disease is slowly progressive and that there's a long prodrome gives us some optimism that this may be a target period for disease-modifying therapy. And finally, the pathophysiological links between a beta and tau are still very much under investigation. And I think that tau imaging, one of the hottest new things in the field, should accelerate our understanding of this connection between these two very important proteins in Alzheimer's. I'll leave you with five references that I think are, are excellent references to read further about. The Clifford Jack and uh, David Holtzman article on biomarker modeling. Uh, the review uh, from Roberson's group on the dendritic hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease. I'll mention as well this paper from Lee Wei Tsai's group on the road to restoring neural circuitry is good to read about synaptopathies. I think uh, Dennis Selko and John Hardy have done a great job talking about the amyloid hypothesis, and this is also an excellent review on the amyloid hypothesis from Musiak and Holtzman. Thank you very much.